Good afternoon. On behalf of AAWE board member and director of professional development, Neil Otto, it's my pleasure to welcome you to another webinar hosted by the American Association for Employment and Education. Today's topic is finding a life balance. My name is Tim Newbert and I serve as AAWE's executive director. Please allow me to cover just a few housekeeping matters before we begin with today's topic. During the webinar, all attendees will be muted by default. However, you are encouraged to submit your questions, comments, or responses throughout the presentation via the chat or Q&A tools within Zoom. When using chat, you are encouraged to change the recipient default to all presenters and attendees to maximize participation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to attendees and AAWE members. If you are not currently a member of AAWE, please visit our website, aaee.org, for more information. We are a professional association intent on positively impacting education through professional connections. Related to that mission, we connect the three critical groups involved with the preparation, recruitment, and retention of pre-K through 12 educators, university professionals and others who prepare educators, school system professionals and others who recruit, hire, and retain them, and of course, educator candidates themselves. We offer annual publications such as the Job Search Handbook for Educators. We conduct an educator supply and demand survey each fall and winter, resulting in a spring report, which is coming soon. We host a pre-K through 12 job board and a calendar of education job fairs held around the country. We host webinars such as this one on topics relevant to our membership. We sponsor teacher scholarships and school system mini grants to support teacher pipelines. We host an annual conference and education career fair each fall, and we host teacher job fairs, such as our virtual event next Thursday, June 10th. Joining me today are Tracy Montgomery and Julie Paskett, who both serve as senior career advisors at Kent State University in Ohio. Tracy and Julie have joined us today to present Finding a Life Balance an interactive, creative way to deconstruct the roles you play in life with the intention of leading you to discovering your own personal ideal balance. I'll now turn it over to you, Tracy and Julie. Okay, thank you. So thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to be here with you all. Um, we'd like to take a moment to introduce ourselves. As he had mentioned, I'm Tracy Montgomery. I'm a senior career advisor in career exploration development. Um, I've been in my position for about three years. Um, and after receiving my master's from Kent. As a career advisor, I specialize in working with student athletes, veterans, exploratory students, as well as coordinating our career navigation course. And I'm Julie Paskett, a senior career advisor. Um, I also work in career exploration and development at Kent State and have been in my position for a little over four years. My specialty areas are the LGBTQ plus community, K-12 education and careers in social services and the Honors College. I'm also an instructor for the career navigation course. Uh, today, we're going to be talking to you about navigating your career and finding your life balance. This presentation is designed to be useful to anyone at any stage in your career, whether you're experiencing a current change in career or not. Um, we have activities built into today's session, so you may want to have a paper and writing utensil on hand or an open Word document as we begin. So let's get started. First, I'm going to set you two challenges. In the first challenge, think of five people who are generally happy all of the time. They're happy at work, at home, really anywhere. Think of five people who show their happiness a majority of the time. Do you have those people in mind? Um, you can write them down if it's helpful to you, but you don't have to, but I'll give you a few more seconds to think about it. Okay, now for the second challenge. Think of five people who are not generally happy. Maybe they seem happy at home, but miserable with their job or work or vice versa. Okay. 
Now I'd like you to take a few moments to think about which challenge was easier for you. Um, and feel free to put comments throughout in the chat. We would love this to be an open conversation as we go. So think about which challenge was easier, which one took more time. I know I didn't give you a whole lot of time to do either. Um, but and also, what are your thoughts right now? So we have one comment that number two is easier. And that's typically what we see. So um, what was the point of um, having you do this? Unfortunately, the point usually makes itself. It's usually much easier to name adults who are unhappy or miserable, disappointed on a regular basis and acknowledging this and also acknowledging that it's a sad reality, but that it doesn't have to be, tends to get people listening. It's a different perspective. And this is where we get people listening, wondering where are we going with this? So why are so many people miserable? And as Julie mentioned, most people don't have a hard time answering the second question. Um, as much as they do the first. And it's really sad that even when we ask a whole classroom of students that how many don't even can't even figure out five people to name for the first question. So why are so many people miserable? Um, it's honestly because they don't embrace the true definition of career that encompasses all roles in our lives. See, a career isn't just a job or what we do for a living. A career is the compilation of all of our roles, mother, wife, supervisor, teacher trying to compartmentalize certain roles like many people believe they should do makes it hard to be cohesive and therefore more difficult to be happy as a whole. Um, in reality, we all know that we're so much more than our job title. Um, how often do we get acknowledged for our other roles when we are in that job title, right? It's rare. Um, so let's not forget all the roles that each of us play. And you know, we have to, acknowledging those roles, it helps us become a better person and better all the roles that we have. This exercise is just one simple way to acknowledge how we are more than our job title. In the process though, this exercise also reveals um, our priorities in a way that many of us haven't thought of maybe before and provides a basis for which we can measure what an ideal balance in our life looks like. So that brings us to our first activity. Um, what we'd like for you to do at home is take out a piece of paper or open a Word document on your computer and make a list of your 10 ideal life roles. These do not have to be in any particular order and they are roles you are currently playing but may also include important roles to you that you are not playing right now because of life circumstances. So you can see Tracy's list up here and also my list. Um, we ask that you keep your list to yourself and don't put it in the chat, but we want to make sure we that you write down your 10 roles um, or list them out on a computer and we'll give you a few moments to do that. Now while you're multitasking, so we're still giving you a few minutes, um, but when you're listing your 10 roles, take some time to think about whether or not some of those roles can be broken up. So for example, by job description, I am simply a senior career advisor. However, my job consists of various roles within that, and some are quite different than others. Um, so for example, I super supervise a full-time staff member and five graduate assistants. So supervisor is an important role within my job. I also do some, sometimes do more than advise. I love the part of my job where I get to do career counseling. Um, I also get to be in charge of a curriculum design and implementation of a course on campus and get to teach it. So therefore I'm also a teacher and instructor as well. So again, try to consider where maybe some of your roles may be broken up into more than one.
Okay. If we need some more time or Julie, do you think we should move on? We'll go ahead and move on. Hopefully you have your 10 roles. Okay, great question. Um, the list of 10, there's no particular order yet. So we're gonna, you're gonna worry about that next. Excellent question. Your 10 can be any order whatsoever. So, and by the way, it is very important to have that 10, you'll see. And this is one of those things too that Julie and I, we often find many people who do this exercise, even when it's all said and done, there's a lot of reflection that goes on where people will go back and look at it again. So pick 10 and we're gonna keep on moving. All right. So now this is where it gets interesting. So one thing that is consistent in life are struggles, right? And I'm not being a pessimist. I'm actually very much an optimist, but the truth is that's one thing that we can count on in life. Um, whether they're brought on as a result of our own doing or whether they're out of our control, they will always be present. I think this is very important to recognize with anyone when talking about balance, such as this exercise, but also in general. Please note, however, that it doesn't excuse pessimistic perspective or thinking. Actually, it does quite the opposite. You see, I always say that it's about perspective. By acknowledging that problems um, will be consistent, I can now empower myself to take charge of what I can control, not be surprised by the inevitable presence of struggle, yet at the same time can live to the fullest knowing that problems are just a reality, but by no means are struggles ever to be an excuse. So with that being said, life happens, right? I usually don't have to clarify any more what I mean by that, but just by saying that. Circumstances in life often cause us to have to prioritize or to choose where we put our energy. And so with that in mind, look at your list of 10 and cross off four from your list. If circumstances called for prioritization, what four would you let go first? All right. Now that you've taken your list down from 10 to six, we're gonna ask you to cross off two more. And this is where it usually gets pretty tough. As Tracy's talked about, when life gets more difficult, we sometimes have to make difficult decisions. And as you're doing this, and, and by the way, Julie can attest this too when we've done this, people will literally start to get tense or upset um, they, they look at it as if I'm asking them to do something impossible. So please keep in mind that this is hypothetical. Nobody's crossing off their grandparents um, or anything like that, but it can sometimes feel that way, which because it is a priority, but the truth is as much as we try to acknowledge that we can, we want to be everything all the time, we can't, as Julie mentioned, life sometimes doesn't allow that. So I want you to think about what guidelines did you use without even realizing that you set them when you crossed off certain roles? What type of checks and balances did you go through to roll out two more? Why did you eliminate those two but left the last four standing? You see, it's these thought processes and rationale that are key to this exercise, as most of us have never been forced to intentionally use such rationale. So, I can give some more time if we need it, or we can go on to a final instructions for this step. And we are gonna stop and talk a little bit more. As you see, Julie and I are sharing our personal roles as well. So I don't want anybody to get all, all heated over this, but you can see what's coming with the last step, right? So now we're down to, you went from 10 to six, you went down to four, and I know that was probably hard. And this is the part where people really get upset, but I need you to bear with us. <laughs> as hard as it is, life gets really, really hard. And sometimes you only have enough energy to sometimes get through the day and to take care of what you have to. So I want you to cross off two more. Now, 
as you'll notice with my example, as you're thinking about the two final two that you have left, it's not that I do not love my husband. <laughs> okay. So just being very honest here. However, he is most aware of my passion to help others in a very meaningful way. He knows that if I won the lottery and decided to stop working and just stay at home, that I would not be as good of a mom and wife as I was when I was giving myself the opportunity to be in a position to be a second mom. When that was through when I was a high school teacher for 11 years, to even what I do now. This has taken place because of the different roles I've played in my career and outside of my career. I like to build a strong lasting rapport with students, becoming a mentor. It's happened by being involved with others in the community of some sort. And it sort of latched onto me for one reason or another and put me in that mentor position to be like a second mom. When I am able to be that role, I am better at all my other roles. As far as being a mother, there was never any question about that. And not because it was the right thing to do, but because literally my, my sons are my world. This is the reason why, even as a career counselor, um, or somebody who urges to pursue a direction which makes people happy. I understand if someone has to compromise their own dream temporarily because life happens and they need to do what they need to do to keep those top two priorities in check. If being there for my kids meant getting a different job, I absolutely would, even if I didn't want to. Would I be as happy with my work? No, but I would certainly not be happy if I kept a job I loved at the cost of not being there for my kids. You see, knowing these top two are key. It keeps us in check, especially when life gets difficult. Um, another important note I wanna make quickly, if you noticed um, the role of daughter, and I cross out role of daughter here, but I cross out kind of early. I also wanna acknowledge that this exercise is something important to do every so often because when life happens and circumstances change, so will our roles and how we prioritize them. When my dad passed away, that daughter role was different to me. It's not that I'm not close to my mom and I don't love her, but my dad was my world. So daughter would have stayed up on that top 10 list way longer. So do this more, do this fairly regularly. Absolutely. Um, and uh, in the same vein, so I um, am about to, uh, in preparing for this, I was thinking about when would be a good time for me to redo this as well, because um, my roles are changing as well. So I'm um, about ready to become a mom, and I've been a stepmom, and you saw that stepmom was one that I crossed off um, fairly early or fairly late just within those last two. And it's not that I don't love my stepchildren. Um, they are a huge part of my world and a huge part of why I married my husband. Um, but for me, being a wife makes me a better stepmom and makes me better in all of my roles. And so um, that comes before um, before that role. However, that might change in the next couple of months as I um, bring a new little one home and so might be be reorganizing and thinking about and as I was preparing this I was also thinking about how this how looking forward how this is going to change for me as well. So as Tracy said, it is something that changes over time and that you want to reflect on and do occasionally. Um, so we're going to give you just a couple of moments for yourself to reflect on and identify your own top two roles. So now that you've identified your top roles, we're going to go back to the entire list of 10 again um, and looking at the all 10 and not just the top two to do another activity with the entire list. So according to an, an article on a psychologist from many years ago, um, the, came up with this idea that all roles in life in American society anyway can be divided up between work, love, and friendship. Now, I think if you're anything like Julie and I, we would love to add several more categories to that, but we're gonna roll with it for the purposes of this exercise. So if looking at your 10 roles, I want you to go through and label each one by your definition of love, work, and friendship, label each role as either love, work, or friendship. And Julie, feel free to add to that as well. 
Sure. So just thinking about some of these definitions have different definitions for different people. Um, so you want to label them on in your understanding of love, work, and friendship. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it always will consist um, or, or be the traditional um, what might be the first thought. So in Tracy's example up here, you can see that, that sister and daughter are labeled with a friendship list, uh, with a friendship label, whereas other people might have that labeled as love. Um, and either is okay. This is a very personalized one. So once you have your 10 labels, you're going to use this list to create a pie chart of your ideal balance. What you want to do is and there's 10 listed, uh, 10 roles listed there. So each role is going to represent 10% of your chart. For Tracy's example here, you can see how friendship appeared four times in her list. So it's 40% of her pie chart and love appeared two times. So that's 20%. So remember, this is your ideal balance and may not be the balance that you currently have. Um, so take a few moments to uh, figure out that balance for yourself. For me, my ideal balance is 50% love, 40% work, and 10% friendship. And also keep in mind as you're doing that, one of the reasons that we absolutely positively love this exercise and a lot of people appreciate it is because the truth is your ideal balance is not the same as somebody else's. This is a perfect way to understand what is your ideal balance. And that's why you look at your roles, you look at what they play in your life. And then now this chart kind of shows you what your ideal balance is. Instead of trying to read so many books and trying to figure out why do I keep failing at balance? Because the truth is sometimes we're trying to reach a balance that we feel others say we should meet when really we are all very different. And so we need to acknowledge what our ideal balance is. So, now that we've had you create a pie chart based on your 10 roles that you play in life, work, friendship, love, and what your ideal balance looks like, now I want you to take a second. And if you had to quickly draw a pie chart for what your current balance looks like, what would it look like? So as you can see the example, um, notice that you have my ideal balance, but then I look at what my current balance is. And I think we all can attest that different times in our lives, that balance gets skewed, right? We can't always have that perfect balance. But when we don't know what our ideal balance is, it's much harder to try to figure out where to start to gain that balance. So I want you to look at what yours is versus current. And then start asking yourself questions. Is this permanent? Is it temporary? Do they align? And so based on this example, think about any internal struggles that might come along with this. So when somebody comes to me and they would show me this balance and it's work is 70%, sometimes we might know it's just a busy time that we can't really avoid that, but we also know it's temporary. But when somebody says, to be honest, I don't see this ever changing, then that's when deeper questions need to come into play.
So again, we wanted to give you a few moments to think about your ideal balance in relation to your current balance. Um, and also remember that you are welcome to utilize the chat or the question and answer feature if you have any questions at this point to think about. And as Tracy mentioned, when thinking about that current and how it differs, if it does differ, now ideally in a perfect world, they look exactly the same um, and things would be going well. Um, but we would assume that you were not necessarily signing up for a webinar on how to create life balance if everything you feel is currently in balance. Um, so there's probably a little bit of differences there. And think about that. Remember it, and, and really emphasize what Tracy talked about. Is this permanent or is this temporary? Um, because the answer to that makes a huge difference in the next steps and in what you um, choose to do to recover from that and to look at and, and start to make choices to more align your current balance with your ideal balance. So I love looking at this example to kind of show you like how, while this is such a simple exercise in many ways, to have us think about how this information empowers us, but also empowers us in relationships and career, all our different roles. So take a look at partner A and partner B here. Each of them, this is each of their ideal balance. So if you had to think about it and you look at what their ideal balance is, I'm sure you could possibly guess what they might fight over the most. So take a look at that for a second. So think about what would happen if partner A, who clearly 70% is dedicated to work. And I think it's important to acknowledge that because I normally say towards the beginning of this is we sometimes hear people judge people about ideal balance without meaning to. If they know somebody that works all the time and you hear somebody say, well, don't they have kids? Think about what that's implying. That because they work so much that they aren't prioritizing family. But again, that's why we have to know our own ideal balance. So partner A, 70%, they find satisfaction in work. But partner B finds mostly in love. I'm sure you can imagine the arguments are quite a bit over, why do you work so much? Why are you working all the time? If partner A decides to say, you know what? Maybe they're right. I'm going to stop all that and try to be more the ideal balance of what everybody expects. What's eventually going to happen is resentment. There has to be conversation and compromise and talk, and you can't do that until you know what your own ideal balance is. But you have to understand that partner A and partner B, if they're keeping their ideal balance, they are better at their other roles. Partner A is going to be a better partner and in that 20% love if they're able to carry out their ideal balance with work. As Tracy mentioned, um, knowing others' balances um, creates a better sense of compromise and understanding in relationships. And this isn't just, this can definitely be personal relationships and understanding your partners um, and, and maybe your husband or wife or whatever that partner is to you, understanding that relationship, but also goes into understanding work relationships as well. So here's another example. You're looking at my chart um, next to one that represents my supervisor's chart. And let me preface this by saying that I absolutely love my supervisor. We work really well together and we get along very well. But you can see major differences in this chart here. My supervisor is someone who works through her lunch breaks. She consistently works way more than 40 hours a week um, and is definitely very engaged in her work. Last summer, she was out on maternity leave and she was sending us emails throughout her maternity leave. Um, and we were, we were having conversations about that. 
on the other hand, um, I get all of my work done and I value work, but I also leave the office and turn off my computer at 5 p.m. Um, and I go home and don't look at or respond to emails after work hours. Um, I have been on, on vacation for, we're doing some renovations on my house, so you might hear some noise in the background, but I've been off work um, for the last couple of days and have not checked my email except in regards to this webinar um, and have not answered the chat messages um, or phone calls that have come in. So luckily, my supervisor and I are educated on this theory and it hasn't caused conflict between us because we're able to have those conversations. But I'm sure in thinking about your balance and potentially the balance of your colleagues, you can see where that conflict could arise. Um, that if you are supervising someone who has a very different balance and prioritizes their roles differently, um, that could cause some, some issues and some things to think about. Um, additionally, this is an important time to think about how those reactions um, and how those priorities can cause reactions to different reactions to challenges or major changes. Uh, where your ideal balance is helps you pay attention to what you need to be thinking about when major changes happen and where you might need to make some adjustments. So let's take COVID-19 and the last year and a half of the pandemic as an example. Um, thinking about what stressors each of us have focused on in the pandemic and what has caused the biggest concern for us. So think about how does working from home impact those roles and impact that balance and and what do you um, focus on in concerns of those. So looking at my supervisor and I and those working from home challenges and what that has created um, between us. My supervisor reported being way more productive in working from home because she didn't get interrupted or pulled into work conversations um, and personal conversations. She, for her, working from home helped her work harder and helped her spend more time at work because she didn't have a commute um, and she didn't have to worry about um, other colleagues stopping by her office. She could very much focus on what she was doing. For me, on the other hand, working from home spent more, meant more quality time with my family um, and strengthened my relationships because of that. I was able to spend my lunch breaks with my husband for a while. Um, we were able to, um, right at, after work ended and not worry about that commute time, we were able to cook dinner together. Um, and so we were able to, to adjust in different ways and had different challenges. Um, I struggled a little bit more with getting work done because my husband was also working from home for a while and so struggled a little bit more with focusing on that where my supervisor um, felt that it was a really great thing for her work and her job. So you can see that the based on our balances, our challenges and struggles when it comes to change can be different and we need to focus on and potentially check in with others on different things as those come up. So, and just to kind of add to that as well, um, like with my mother, for example, I knew that I didn't do this exercise with her, so I didn't have her draw up her ideal balance. But when those, there are people that are close enough to us that we know a lot of what their, where their priorities are. And for my mother, I would tell you that she probably had 70 or 80% love that was invested in my dad. And, and so knowing that, I knew that when he passed away, I had to keep a closer eye on her than normal because she had to restructure her entire balance. She had to restructure where she put her priorities and her new roles. And so again, as Julie mentioned, this is great for even knowing how to check up on others based on what's important to them. For somebody whose work isn't as important, it's going to be horrible if they get laid off from their job, but it might not be as bad for them as somebody who has majority of love and suddenly they have no access to their family or friends. So again, knowing people's ideal balance helps us not only with ourselves, but with others as well.
So in just briefly, I don't need to spend too much time on this, but knowing the why behind categories and how we define each of those um, is so important and taking note of the why. Um, also making sure we look at that discrepancy between ideal balance and current balance and is it's temporary. For example, even when I work with students and they're overwhelmed with school, but their top priorities are family, when they know that, they know that sometimes even making a priority to even text their family members every so often will help them maintain that balance a little bit more to keep in touch with what their top priorities are, even if they can't maintain that exact balance right then. It can be a predictive reactions. Um, and then of course, noting most importantly, why is this so important for our career? Again, we can't be happy in our career if we don't recognize what our own balance is and where to put our energy and our priorities and not guilt trip ourselves when we're in the process of making sure we're meeting our ideal balance. Tracy and I do this exercise a lot in our class. Um, career navigation is taught uh, to first year student. Well, it's open to all students, but the majority of students who enroll are first year students who are, are exploratory. They, they haven't chosen a major yet. Um, and we do this exercise and talk about it in terms of that relationship to career and talk about certain careers have certain expectations of balances as well. Um, and so thinking about those decisions and making a career decision based on that balance. Um, and that that goes back to that permanent or temporary piece of things that uh, our current balance or our expected balance for our job, is it temporary? Is it a busy time at work? Is it recruitment season? And so you're hiring a lot of people um, or the first day of the school year when um, you're rest restarting with new students, that tends to be a really busy time of the year. And so work is obviously going to be more in that current balance than at other times. However, um, we sometimes have students who, I had a student this past semester who their balance um, was very much focused on over half of their, their pie chart was love and a friendship. Um, but then what they would, the career they were looking into was accounting and accounting can sometimes be a field where the expectations are that you're working 50, 60 hours a week consistently on a regular regular basis. And so that student and I had a conversation of, does this really match? And is this something where you're going to have to give up your ideal balance for long periods of time? And how comfortable are you with that? Or should we look at other careers that might align better with that balance? And so it really is something to think about in terms of your career and can often, um, Tracy and I have definitely seen the impact on that in career um, decision making. Absolutely. So we'd like to do one final activity for today. Um, so looking back at those 10 roles that um, you those original 10 roles that you had, um, we want you to create a little bit of a concept map with that. Um, so going back to that original list of 10, place yourself at the beginning, at the middle of the map, um, and then create circles or bubbles branching out for it from it with each of those 10 roles. From those, those branches, list off the responsibilities or the tasks that are associated with those roles. Some roles may have more responsibilities associated with them than others. We'll give you a few moments to do just the, the basics and your first thought when it comes to what are your responsibilities or tasks associated with each role.
We recognize that this could become quite a lengthy list, so focus on the first few my the few that come to mind with for you. If we were if you were to list out every single responsibility or task for all of those 10 roles, we would probably be here all day and would probably be more overwhelmed than when we started this conversation. One of the resources that we utilized in developing this presentation is a book called Fair Play by the, the author Eve Radowski. Um, and if, if Eve Radowski and her friends did this, this a similar activity to this and referred to the list that they created as the shit I do list, um, discusses how creating that list um, is what led to her writing the, the, that book um, and developing the fair play concept, which we draw pieces from for this next part of the presentation. It can also be thought of as your mental load. All of those tasks and responsibilities that you need to maintain or stay on top of your life and your roles. The mental load is just that, uh, it's a load. So it can often feel heavy and overwhelming, which can lead to levels of burnout. So we're going to talk about burnout for a few seconds. Um, that word has been tossed around a lot and more so recently as responsibilities have changed and been stressed by some of us working from home, some homeschooling their children, managing our mental health and, and through the pandemic and all of these have created new stressors in addition to the tasks and responsibilities that we already had and were already maintaining. But what does burnout actually look like? So according to Herbert Furtenberger, the American psychologist who coined the term burnout in 1975, there are three characteristics that define it. Emotional exhaustion, which is the fatigue that comes from caring too much for too long. This is the feeling of be just being tired, drained, and unable to cope depersonalization, the depletion of empathy, caring, and compassion. These are those feelings when you start feeling cynical, emotionally distant, and numb. And finally, the decreased sense of accomplishment. So an unconquerable sense of futility or feeling that nothing you do makes a difference. Burnout affects performance. It mainly affects those tasks and responsibilities that we just listed for each of those roles. Um, people with burnout can have very negative thoughts about those tasks, find it hard to concentrate, and struggle with creativity. Burnout is highly prevalent. There's a study that says about 20 to 30 percent of American teachers, university professors, and international humanitarian aid workers have moderately high to high levels of burnout. I'm sure that some of you listening can relate to a time when you felt burnout, or maybe you're feeling it right now. I know there have been times in my career when levels of burnout have affected my performance and mental health. The good news is that burnout does not have to be a permanent state. Sometimes recovering from burnout takes a major change, maybe a career change or a move. In other situations, however, it can be smaller decisions and taking time to refocus, make minor changes that can make huge differences. So we're going to talk about one of those ways to make smaller changes. A few months ago, um, a little bit into the pandemic, um, burnout hit Tracy's and my department career exploration and development really hard. So right at the beginning of the fall semester, we were all struggling with adjustments to teaching online, offering virtual events, plus all of the other responsibilities at work and at home. Many of us were trying to navigate homeschooling our children and we'd be, been stuck in our houses for um, what seemed like six months, seemed the entire department hit a burnout wall at about the same time. And then I read a Twitter thread that started a conversation which led to a larger conversation, which led to departmental changes, if you can believe that, all from one Twitter thread that I led, uh, read. 
and we've made some little changes and things got a little better and many of us started to feel re-energized. Um, while that re-energization wasn't an overnight magical occurrence, but more of a slow transition, the conversations made a huge impact. So I want to share with you what we learned and the strategies we implemented that made a difference. The Twitter thread started the conversation was written by the author Nora Jones, who spoke about the analogy of juggling balls in your life. The original analogy Nora Jones was referring to was first mentioned in a commencement speech by Brian Dyson, the CEO of Coca Cola in 1991. In that speech, Dyson said, imagine life as a game in which you are juggling five balls in the air. You name them work, family, health, friends, and spirit, and you're keeping those in, in the air. Nora Jones' Twitter thread proposed that she didn't have five balls in the air, but rather 50 plus were all of those tasks associated with those five categories. So you can think of those, those work, love, and friendship that we just talked about as some of those balls um, as the original categories that were proposed by Dyson, but then also that list that you just made of all of the tasks and responsibilities associated with that as um, separate ones as well. Dyson in his speech went on to describe the balls you're juggling as made of different materials, glass and rubber. The, when you drop a glass ball, it's irrevocably damaged, nicked, or maybe shattered. Rubber balls, on the other hand, bounce when dropped and are able to be added right back into the juggling act. Just as Jones expanded upon the original analogy, others have added a third category of balls to this analogy as well. So plastic is the third category. Plastic balls fall when they're dropped, but they don't bounce or break. They just stay there until you're ready to pick them up again. So utilizing this analogy, my CED colleagues and I examined our work um, to determine our own glass, rubber, and plastic balls. We brought this idea into our staff meeting and supervision discussions and took time with each other and each of our tasks and responsibilities to examine which ones fell where. Many of us, Tracy and I included, also took this analogy home to our personal lives and, and made a difference in thinking about this analogy there as well. So we would like to give you a few moments to identify your own glass, plastic, and rubber balls. Go back to that list you just made on um, um, that map and with the the res responsibilities and tasks that you have and label each of those tasks as glass, something that would cause major damage if you dropped it or um, something that you have to keep up in the air. Rubber, which are things that could potentially be dropped in the short term and will bounce back up um, and without causing any damage um, as you if you don't get them done right away or plastic, things that you can let go of um, until you're ready or able to manage them again. At first glance, it might seem like everything on your list is a glass ball, or at least it did for me. It takes some hard self-talk and examination to recognize that not all of the tasks we feel we need to do are always glass. For example, one of the roles I have listed here is supervisor. I supervise at least two of our student staff members every semester and I'm responsible for most of their daily tasks, task assignments, as well as their professional development over the long term. For me, that daily task part is a glass ball. If I don't assign my students tasks to do or work with them to figure out what they're working on, then the department is paying students to sit idly and other important work doesn't get attended to. When I initially made this list, I felt that their professional development was also a glass ball. How could it not be vitally important to ensure that student employees are being developed into confident professionals? I work in a career office, for goodness sake. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Um, 
after I thought about it, though, I was able to see that their professional development was all uh, was actually rubber, that if I don't attend to it every day in the now, they are not going to suffer in the long run and we can circle back to it and look at it on a on a broader schedule. Additionally, I want you to also consider that sometimes the materials of those balls can change depending on timing or other priorities that pop up, and that's okay too. So just as the list might change with life circumstances, your list might change with life circumstances, the prioritization of those, those tasks and responsibilities might change as well. But this analogy was super helpful in helping our office to recover from, from the stages of burnout that we were facing. And so we wanted to make sure that we took time to share it with you um, and to give you time to think about your own glass, rubber, and plastic balls associated with each of your ideal roles um, to potentially help you figure out that as well. And I'm just going to um, add another example of that you know i thought i had this analogy down when julie and i first talked about this went over it and then when going back to those top two roles again and then when my son went through a tough time i started to realize that some of those things i was stressing about that i thought were glass ball were glass balls they weren't at all because i had no problem setting them aside when my role as a mother needed to step in and so again, it is very, very tough to really sit there and really think, we want to think that everything that we do and juggle is a glass ball. We want to think that it has to be done and juggle perfectly because if it doesn't and we don't maintain it, it might break, but most of them are not glass. And so to really stop and think about that. Um, and a former boss once told me, Tracy, you love to help people and you go out of your way and it's so important to you and you feel bad if you can't go out of your way a lot. He said, but in doing that, I want you to think about you only have your kids in your house for so long. And it, and in that moment, I realized he was referring to a glass ball. That was something I could not get back. Um, and something else was definitely plastic. So just in sharing that personal example, that this will be an analogy you might come back to often.